Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the last in our series of webinars this this uh, week on the strategic farm results from uh, from uh, from the uh, um, can't get my words out. Friday, and the voice is stopping already from our strategic farms around the country, and in particular focusing on strategic farm East today uh, with work from Ryan Barker. The first thing you'll see from the cameras is that Brian isn't here. I'm delighted to say he's become a dad and uh, he's on paternal duties and, and quite understandably that's a priority. So we're, we're working without Brian today, but I'll introduce um, the others in a minute. Uh, we've got a, a great uh, discussion to be had this, this afternoon. So our topic this afternoon is marginal land. Um, what is it and what can we do about it? Um, before we get stuck into the meat of that, I do have to have the obligatory housekeeping slide. Um, we are all, or well, you are all on mute, so we can't hear you and uh, we can't see you, but indeed it is interactive. There is a questions box. Please do uh, fire questions to us uh, because that's how, how it works and, and keeps it live around the country. In terms of timing, uh, don't panic, we're not going to keep going till eight o'clock. Um, it is due to finish about half past two, but we'll see how the discussion goes and, and work that accordingly. Uh, to those of you collecting basis and ROSA points, uh, we you could have entered your details as you booked for that webinar, but if you haven't done that and you'd like to give us your details, put them in the chat function, which is in the panel on the right hand side and in the drop down there, and we can uh, register you for, for the points appropriately. Also to say that this webinar is being uh, recorded for those that uh, can't make it today and it will be available afterwards on our YouTube channel and I'll just show you briefly what that looks like later as well. And finally, for those with uh, a Twitter uh, following and interest, uh, we have got the hashtag and Twitter to Twitter handle there for your, uh, for your use. So I omitted to introduce myself. My name is Philip Dolbert. I form part of the Knowledge Exchange team around the country. Uh, I'm actually based down in the southwest, looking after that region. Um, the Farm Excellence Programme, as many of you know, just to recap, includes a, a number of monitor farms and strategic farms across the whole country, and you can, you can see a map there. And, and myself, along with uh, a group of uh, other Knowledge Exchange managers, we run th that programme across the country. And while well, there's a quick slide here now with our contact details and addresses, that is also on the website and uh, you can you can contact us there for any queries you may have on, on this subject or need any others concerning HDB and the Monitor Farm and Strategic Farm Programme. There are two special people uh, who, who we also give your contact details here for, Emily and Fiona. They're our sort of real key link managers that uh, keep the research projects in touch with us on the ground in the regions and uh, their contacts there, they, they, they mastermind the strategic farm program be between them. I've talked about the Monitor Farm program. As ever, all our events and webinars are all on the events page. Uh, that's a quick screenshot there of it. So if you need to, if you need to see what's going on in your region, just, just click in there on events and, and put in the dates and, and, and Cereals and oil seeds as your as your sector, and it will pull up what's over the, the date period you set. So please do access that to keep an eye on what's happening in your region. One thing that is coming up over the next uh, couple of months are our agronomy conferences. We have our main uh, agronomy national agronomy conference uh, at, uh, on the seventh of December. That's in Peterborough. I'm pretty sure it's nearly fully booked in terms of physical places, but we do have, we are streaming on live, so you'll be able to log in for that uh, from wherever you are and, and enjoy the presentations uh, to suit you. We then take that conference on the road with a slightly adjusted program around the country for, for regional bias, and, and you'll see there the dates uh, from, from the different conferences in the different regions that, that we run, obviously smaller scale, but a bit more local and, and locally orientated in terms of, of subject matter. So next, I, I, coming back to the, the theme of this week, the Strategic Farm Week, you see there the webinars we've held a week. Um, they've all been recorded uh, and that those recordings are available on our YouTube channel, uh, which again is another, is another Google, Google and, and web job to, uh, to access the recordings and you can listen to them in your leisure. Uh, as you see fit, and we'll just see a quick slide of, of what that 
sort of base page looks like of the HDB Serials webinar YouTube channel to, to give you the comfort that, you, that you're in the right place. So that just finishes my very quick um, intro. Uh, as I said, um, I'm delighted. Well, sadly, well, no, it's great news that Brian isn't here because it means he's a dad. But uh, we have got um, some really good people to join us today. David Clark from NIAB uh, joins us as the key researcher that's been doing a lot of the work with Brian on the farm. And he, in a minute, is going to share with us the, the process and the results that, that they've got and what we're going to discuss. Also joined by uh, two uh, fellow colleague or fellow farming colleagues from the Southwest here. Um, Robin Aird is farm manager at Charm Park Estates in Gloucestershire. And John Hawkins is a tenant farmer in Dorset uh, on, a, on an arable unit down there. And they have got various sort of, uh, interests in this subject today. So I thought it'd be really useful to sort of share beyond the strategic farm some, re some real life farming situations and stories, which was sort of blending with the main topic of the day. So without further ado, I, I don't think I forgot anything I should have said, but I'm sure somebody will, will fire at me if, if I haven't. Uh, I'll move over to David. As David um, twiddles the buttons to become my key presenter and show his slides, I will just point out that uh, there is the chat function, the questions box. Please do, as you go along, uh, put in questions there that you'd like to raise within the speakers or me, and I will raise them and, and we'll debate them accordingly. I can see some of you have found the the, the function there because you're putting in your basis details. So please use that as well for for questions. So David, um, if all goes to plan, uh, and as per rehearsal, we'll we'll switch over to you now as presenter, and we'll look forward to hearing your update on uh, the work that you've been doing at Brands. Thank you, Philip. Um, hopefully, you can see my screen. I'll just someone can confirm. Nod. Yeah, no. that's good. Thank you, David. Good. 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 Um, yes, so I'm David Clark. I'm a, a soils and farming systems technician at NIAB. Um, I've been working with NIAB for three or four years now. Um, I'm also doing a PhD looking at very similar things to what we've been doing at Brian, looking at spatial variation across farm and how we can manage that both agronomically and in this case potentially uh, identify areas that may be suitable for environmental schemes. As Philip has attested to, Brian, congratulations, has, has had a baby, so he's not here. So I've put this slide in for him just to briefly introduce where this has taken place. Um, so it's taken place at EJ and Barker and Sons, just sort of just north of Stowe Market. Um, it's a 513 hectare arable uh, farm on a sandy loam, sandy clay loam soil with a 12 year rotation um, featuring winter wheat, all seed rape, spring barley. A herbage grass for seed, spring beans and spring lean seed. You can just see an example of the rotation uh, from one of the fields that we've looked at there. So first, second week, followed by the break and so on. Uh, although it's 530 hectares, we've primarily focused on the farm, the fields that have been in Brian's um, care for over the last 10 years. So we've got a, a sufficient data set. So this, this works out at 35 fields across 457 hectares. You can see them spaced out there varies in size and shapes as always so why is marginal land important and why are we doing this well and um, this is a, a, a little nice graph that i've taken from brian's slides is that how he sees his role as a farmer primarily in a food production role but then has other sources of income and also work to do so environmental considerations um, whether that's countryside stewardship uh, and then also alternative income streams, whether it's solar panels, fishing lakes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as Brian is, uh, Brian on, at Stone Market has been part of the countryside stewardship and higher level stewardship over the last uh, number of years um, and has had a previous experience identifying where best to put some of these schemes. And actually, one of those um, schemes, the flower rich margin, was the feature of work package three this year is looking at how within field margin strips and also on the edges improves biodiversity within the farm. But this project's really come about um, with what's coming forward with the environmental land management scheme ELMS um, with the sustainable farming initiative pilot sort of launched in June um, and carrying on to 2022. Um, we can start to see how this scheme is going to look for farmers and growers across the country. 
Um, for example, just taken out the Sustainable Farming Initiative pilot, um, people, uh, growers will get support for birds and pollinators and paid on the level that they do that at. For example, the advanced, um, the advanced scheme would be 10% of the land entered would, would need to be going to support birds and pollinators, such as wildflower strips and, and bird food strips, and they'll be paid uh, at £74 a hectare for that. So ideally, we want to identify the areas that are of the least economic importance on farm to put these schemes. Um, and this is a, a, something that DEFRA have recognised and, and they recommend in the previous schemes using lower yielding areas as long as they have suitable um, geographic and topographical uh, characteristics so that they can deliver the environmental scheme. We're not completely sure what the local nature recovery and landscape recovery are, are going to look like yet and those pilots going forward. So we, we've focused this research based on our current understanding of what um, environmental schemes look like, mainly based on the countryside stewardship model. So how is this, how is Brian's data being used? Well, Brian's been collecting yield maps since 2011. So we've got 10 years of yield maps across those 35 fields. We then clean them using some processes that have been um, published in the literature, but we've also added a few more just to get rid of some of the issues that we found on Brian's farm. And Brian um, records his total yield for each field um, from a grain trade, grain trade away sales. So we can use this data to then double check that our yield maps are a true representation of what's going on in field. And this is very important. Uh, as we're now no longer just using yield maps to identify patterns, we're identifying them to quantify exact uh, quantities of yield and, and in our case margin. We then use a process called clustering to try and make a bit more sense of this data. We've got a lot of data um, and trying to identify patterns and areas that perform the same and therefore could potentially be treated the same, whether it's agronomically going forward or um, in, in management or it has put into an environmental scheme. We can then access the yield performance across these zones and then using the field level fixed and variable costs that Brian's been um, collecting over the last 10 years, we can create net margin maps across farm that we're confident that are reliable. And then we can draw on other data sources such as soil EC scans, regular satellite imagery, Google Earth, um, historic images, erosion risk maps, and then other sort of context that Brian's got of his farm, i.e. black grass or a short fiddly work. Um, and then we can also look at how what current schemes are paying and what though that land is worth currently from an arable point of view, and then make a decision on whether that's worth potentially looking at other options. So the first step was clean the yield maps, and this is a, a really important, as you'll see, the second really important step that, that probably as growers that may be watching this that may go and try and use this sort of methods on their own farm, whether it's through Gatekeep or other software that can mold, uh, merge and analyse yield maps. I think it is really, really keen and on stress that it's important to have some aspect of cleaning to ensure that you're, you're getting rid of areas that are, are rubbish, particularly when um, if a combine, a field is combined the same way every year, we'll get areas that are potentially very bad each year according to the yield map because they've either half cut or the combine header has not been full. Um, and therefore, it will look like we've got uh, an area of poor performance. In reality, it's just com combined not working at its full potential. So you can see an unprocessed yield map on the left there for the barn field at Brian's, and you can see the combine that the, the path that the combine's taken to, to get that. And we can see that there's some very zero, the very very low yields, and up to 16 tons a hectare uh, in a single line, which is uh, you know unlikely to be a, a genuine reflection of what's going on. So we've used uh, cleaning processes, we've removed, re removed sorry, points that are too far apart from the previous point, as we assume the combine is going too quick and therefore it's either not combine any crop or it's a, a dead pot. Um, we've then identified swaths that are uh, greater than the header width or uh, slightly under the header width um, from each other, so therefore we're assuming that it's a swath, a half cut or a, a just tidying up. You can see those green points there have been removed. The blue points are identified as points um, where the combine is turning, therefore um, we could have areas in the yield or it be turning on headlands that are previously cut, so they were removed. Um, and then the final step was just to remove anything that we thought was unnecessary or outside our expected norm. So these were outliers, so this was just a, 
plus and minus three standard deviations of the mean. And as you can see on the right hand side, um, we've got a cleaned yield map, but we've obviously taken out a reasonable amount of data, um, but it certainly looks like much more what we'd expect to be seeing on farm in terms of what's our yield is varying over space. Just a summary of what that's achieved. Obviously, we started with um, 800, 884,000 points. We reduced that by about 15%, uh, just over 15% from the cleaning, um, and we reduced the standard deviation by nearly two two thirds and the coefficient variation down by 25%. So it's a step that really does need to happen before we start looking at these yield maps over uh, in, in real detail. The next step was just to check that the yield maps are a true representation of what we see on farm and therefore the margins can be trusted. So using the data Brian's got, he's collected from running the grain trailers over the way cell, we can compare what the yield maps average yield is to those that um, Brian has weighed. And generally we saw a good level of accuracy for the winter crops and spring barley um, with majority sort of less than 10% out and this could be variations in field size and the areas actually combined. So I'm not too worried about that. Uh, An okay accuracy for spring beans again with a root mean square error. So you can see that sort of that's the general area of, of 0.7 tonnes. Um, and then a very poor level of accuracy for linseed oats and spring wheat. So we decided because obviously we're not comparing perfectly like for like, that actually anything that's within 10% is likely just to be changes in what we're actually measuring. Therefore, there's no real need to adjust it. We, we believe that's a true representation of what went on the field. So therefore we left them and that was 58% of the yield maps were good. However, we started to look at, we want to look at the other 42% that we didn't think were truly representative of what was going on in the field in that year or what um, Brian weighed. So, these are those yellow points. So a lot of these, by looking at the yield maps, we, we suggest um, can see we're probably errors. The fact that, um, for example, if you've got some back grass areas sprayed out, um, Brian's yield average from the way cells is a total field area divided by what you said off, whereas the combine map will be just taking a whatever was combined. So the field at yield, the field area might be smaller than it was um, actually cut. So therefore we just did a total offtake and gridded the yield map data, calculated how much was total, totally produced from the yield map and how much was weighed over the weigh cell. And we found that actually a further 54 of the 114 fields were well within that 10% error. Um, so therefore they could be kept. But this left 57, so 22% of the fields with differences greater than 10% of that recorded. So this is really something we wanted to adjust for um, to make sure we weren't getting false readings. So we just did a simple conversion um, to, without getting too complicated into it. We just reduced the each yield point by the mean. So this is assuming that although the combine may be over or underestimating yields, the spatial variation in what it was measuring would be the same. Um, which I think we'll have a discussion later about whether that was the right or the wrong thing to do, but um, it was a, sort of the least of worst options from our point of view. So this left us across 35 fields. On average, 75% of the rotation has been spatially mapped. You can see some fields, four fields at the end there with yield maps for every single year and then down to below 50% for some fields. This is mainly due to the herbage grass, a two year herbage grass crop that isn't spatially mapped. Um, it, although the combine, it does combine it, the yield maps are, are, are nonsense, um, so we couldn't use them. So there is a limitation in the approach that we are only measuring here a certain proportion of the, the rotation. I'll talk about why that may not matter too much in terms of some schemes um, going forward. And as you can see, uh, naturally our confidence in what we're finding will increase as we've got more and more yield data. Again, as we collect more and more yield data, the confidence will, will increase with that. So we've got our clean yield maps, um, just an example here, uh, which is all very nice. And we can start to sort of see general patterns in the data set. For example, we can see that there's a, a dodgy bit down the bottom here. But it's very hard to quantify what that variation is across years and how consistent that is and actually quantify the, the level of variation in terms of 0.5 or 1 or 1.5 tonnes a hectare. So we turn to a method called clustering to identify patterns in the yield map data set. This is um, methods that have been developed in the literature through AHDV projects. So a group from Rothamsted and BGS and SOIL first looked at 2016, how clustering can be used on yield maps to identify 
So the management zones, and then Kirsty and Alice and Andy at uh, Rotten said have taken this further and, and, and developed a, a clustering algorithm that will not just um, will rely on data sets where we've got missing data sets and it can look around that. The brief explanation of what we do is it's a fuzzy game means clustering. It's basically just looking for patterns in the data sets and machine learning algorithm. It aims to group objects and R point yield points into clusters. Um, and we can choose the number of clusters as a subjective decision. We just use a, a, a calculation called entropy that's basically measuring how disordered the, the data is. And we, we, we tend to go for the point where the disorder has dropped the most from the previous number of clusters. Um, we could obviously keep going until we've got 100 clusters, but actually they're going to be very subtle differences in yield that aren't practical from a management point of view. And just a brief um, sort of a de demonstration of there of what we do. If we've got a, a yield from 2011 and yield from 2013 for an individual point in the farm, we can plot that together and we can see, well, obviously those blue points are following the same patterns. Once they're high in 2011, low in 2013, the red are sort of middle 2011, high in 13, and then we've got a low cluster, low yielding cluster that's low in both years. So this gives us or gave us a yield performance map across the farm. Um, so these clusters are actually ranked by margin, but just to give some sort of sense to it. So the number one, which is the light blue in each field, is the highest yielding cluster across the rotation. Um, doesn't it, you know, it may not be the highest every year, but across the average it is the best performing cluster. Uh, and then all the way down to some fields that have up to six clusters. Um, which is the worst. So if there's only three clusters in, in one field, cluster one will be the highest, two will be the second highest, and three will be the worst. This is a useful uh, data set, not just from a point of marginal land, but an agronomic useful resource. Um, Brian can look at this and they go, well, can management be altered on some of these low yielding zones? What's causing them? Are they yielding low every year or is it just some years? potentially use this map to then do targeted soil sampling or inspection. Is it a nutrient deficiency that's causing the variation? Is it change in soil type? How could we manage change management for this? This is something I'm looking at in part of my PhD and not something we've looked at too much into this project, but something going forward Brian um, might want to look at. So we sort of keep working to, to get into these ideas of how are we looking at space and, and time, looking at marginal land. So we've, we've gone from 457 hectares to 35 fields down to 159 clusters. And they, on average, we've got areas of about 2.9 hectares, um, but these range from less than 0.2 hectares up to 13 hectares. And the idea being that each one of those clusters, we can expect to perform exactly the same, or all the points in that cluster, we expect to perform the same year on, year out. So then using um, Brian's field level um, fixed and variable cost, sorry, we can then attribute a margin and mean net margin to the each year. Uh, and this is just for ease of looking over the whole farm. This is just mean across the whole rotation. Um, so you can see actually that in terms of, if we're, you know, what we define as marginal, but actually there's very few areas that are below sort of four or five hundred consistently pounds per hectare. Uh, and generally a lot of the farm is up uh, over 560, 500, up to 600 pounds a hectare. You will notice that some look to be a lot worse than others. For example, uh, field three down here um, is yellow and red. However, it's, it's important to look at each field in its own. It's very hard to compare across fields because of the fact we're measuring very different things in different years. For example, field three, although it looks like it's a very low yielding field and, and very low uh, mean net margin, that's primarily probably because we've only got two wheat yields data um, and we've got two break crops. So effectively, half of our data has been from break crops. It's important to look at each field in an individual uh, case, unless obviously you've got groups of fields that are that follow the same rotation across across time. So just going to go over a couple of case studies and how how we can use this data to inform decisions. So this is a case study of Long Meadow. Hopefully everyone can see it's a bit small, um, but you can generally see the idea. We've got our our ten yield map. This, this field has been mapped across the whole rotation. We can see the shallow EC has slight variation in soil. We have a heavier 
um, sort of clay soil at the top of the field, goes into a um, slightly lighter and then a lighter middle and heavier on the outside. You can see the elevation, it slopes from north to south. Um, eventually, uh, why we see some sort of change in soil texture. And then you can see how it's been clustered. So originally it was clustered uh, oh, just sort of how each grid cell performs across the rotation. And we can do a sm add smoothing to make to make this a bit more easy to read effectively. Um, and then down the bottom there is the yield performance of each of those clusters across the whole rotation. So we can see at the top part of the farm, the top part of the field, uh, cluster three is the poor performing cluster in almost every year, with the exception of the 2012 winter wheat crop. So it's useful that we've identified where the poor performing parts are, but it's hard to then describe whether it's actually suitable for environmental land management scheme or a countryside stewardship. So then we can, oh, sorry, one more thing is it, it's interesting how we're trying to identify the farm to split, split the fields back up into uh, different management or, or identify areas that should be treated differently. Um, this is the, the field, same field in 1945, and you can see that, that the um, growers back then probably saw the same sort of spatial variation. It, the top bit was heavier, different type, um, harder to work or whatever that, that would mean. Uh, and therefore the field's been split up in that way back then. So looking at the economic performance across the field, so we can see how that yield variation um, has goes into a, a variation in margin. So we can see the, the mean for the cluster one, which is the high yielding uh, purple cluster, is 678 pounds a hectare. Unlikely to be, ever be suitable for a scheme in the long run, particularly where we've got um, some wheat years well over uh, 1,200 pounds a, a margin. And then we get into the green, it's not quite the same, um, but generally a very consistent um, pattern that almost all years the green is below the purple, the exception of 2017, 2012, and then the blue is the low yielding. And we can see the margin there is drops by 130 to 140 pounds down to 440 pound a hectare, much more in line what we potentially expect to see from a scheme. However, there is big variation in that yield across time, up to 1,200 pounds nearly in some years, but as low as you know, minus 300 in bad years, such as the, the spring bean year. So it's, it's, I'm still not sure we've worked out how best to identify those sorts of variation and how to account for that when we're trying to describe what the long-term performance of a zone is. Um, can we expect that that spring bean will always do zero year, uh, a negative margin, or was it just a bad year? Um, so without having numerous spring bean year data, it's quite hard to tell that. So primarily we're focused on the winter wheat. But if we were to think about uh, putting this into schemes or, or looking at the certain feasibility of putting them into a scheme, we would probably split the field similar to something like this. Um, we've got the identified the low yielding cluster at the top. We wouldn't want to go perfectly in that cluster because that would give us a very fiddly, odd looking field. Um, and then again, we might straighten the edge up down the, uh, down the right hand side uh, with zone two. And we can see that the yield uh, margin across each zone as an average is actually slightly higher than the cluster because we've got bits of good performing land in there. Um, so 470 and 502. So that's what we'd compare to the schemes. So briefly, we've just had a, a quick look at that. So just using a, a simple AB1 scheme of pollen and nectar mix, Brian calculated the cost of establishing that in the first year at £425 a hectare. We've got option income of about £500 or £511 and then um, the £60 management over the next two to five years um, with a profit of £451. And you can see if we were to do that, uh, what I've plotted here effectively is if we were to introduce that scheme in year 2011, if we were to introduce it in 2012, 13, 14, 15, so on, on, each, on zone one, just focusing on zone one here. And you can see how in some years it's more profitable, or if we'd introduced it in 2011, for example, where we get a very good wheat year, um, we'd have a negative margin compared to a crop field, whereas the second wheat and then into our break crop, and then a first and second wheat, we get a positive margin over a crop land. Again, going into the spring beans, which is actually followed by a good winter wheat crop, we get a negative. So it's, it's not a clear cut decision where the land is marginal, and that's where a, a grower might have to look at, well, does it make life a lot easier to manage the field? You know, can I, although we may lose, you know, for example, if we were to introduce in 2016, the, across that rotation, the margin is 200 pound less, but 
as it greatly improved how I could manage the field to a, to a point of improving it by 200 pounds or so. So just another example, um, Wally's is a, where we can look at something slightly different. Um, so we can see there's quite big variation within quite a small field, both in, in soil texture, we go from a, a sort of reasonably uh, medium soil on the top down to very light soil at the bottom of the slope and then to a meadow soil uh, at the bottom in that little corner. And we can see how that impacts yield with the clusters across years. So we can see that there's the, the light area and the headlands that perform consistently the worst in terms of margin across years, um, down to 352 pounds a hectare on average. Um, however, they're not particularly uniform in terms of their, where they're situated. So again, if we were to introduce a scheme, um, oh sorry, if we introduce a scheme, we'd likely have to be taking out parts of the field that are potentially yielding higher compared to that zone. So this is a, a field that we may then start to look at other um, so other decision making process and why we might want to induce this into a scheme or not induce it in schemes it might be. And one of those resources is things like the environment, uh, the erosion risk mapping potential from SIMAP. This is based on slope, land use and the catchment. And it basically models the risk of soil erosion and nutrient erosion from the land. As we can see, there's a reasonably steep slope on this field down into the river Dove. Uh, therefore, it's been categorised as quite high risk of erosion. Therefore, potentially, um, we may want to look at taking this bottom part of the field out to mitigate against this, but also that encounters most of the poor performing part of the field um, with a mean yield, of, a mean margin of £443 across the rotation. Again, we can perform a similar analysis, and again, it's going to be very close. I think one thing we'll take away from this, certainly on Brian's farm, is what's marginal is very marginal. There's not any clear cut um, 200, 100 pound zones that are consistently poor. You know, they can, all parts of the farm can produce a good wheat crop, um, but therefore across the rotation does um, bring the margins up. So it's going to be drawing on decisions such as this or looking at other sources, such as how easy it is to, uh, does it make life easier for the field and what is the environmental risk of that area? Also, what the environmental good can come and putting it into to a scheme uh, that then brings a decision as it's a much more holistic view. So the final little case study is this is just one that Brian has previously tidied up in terms of making it keeping the straight edge working edges. You can see in 2019 that, that the right and the left hand side have been cleared up. We can see sort of some distinct zones uh, within that, the blue uh, low yielding zone. Um, which is primarily what was taken out, and we can see the margin uh, again, nearly 600 pounds in the good, um, good part of the fields, um, and then uh, 150 to 200 pounds, 180 pounds below this in that, that blue zone. So areas two and three were taken out in 2019 by Brian, um, and we can see that the average of the margin across the years prior to that, prior to him taking this out, was 459 pounds, 473. So they you know, are in hindsight that they were certainly the areas that should be taken out both from a, a margin point of view, but also how it makes life easier to, to manage the field. Um, and then we've probably identified a second sort of potential third area that could again, um, a, a low yielding zone, actually lower yielding and lower margin than the two zones that were taken out, but also straightens up both edges to make working life easier um, around the woods. Again, taking into consideration that it's still east facing, south facing, therefore we shouldn't get any sort of negative impact on the environmental scheme if we were to put one in there from the wood. So that's another, another thing we're thinking about uh, when looking at this data in context. So briefly, the sort of the key points we've come from this is the economic performance maps do make it easier to identify sites most suitable, and you can see I've got inverted commas on most suitable for environmental schemes. Um, with Brian, the, the marginal maps have shown that actually a lot large parts of the farm are quite profitable. There are, there's very few areas of the farm that are, uh, you may be classed as marginal compared to what you might like pay from a scheme. Um, so that, therefore, that's when decisions will likely need to draw on other concepts, such as does it improve the ease of operation greatly? Can it improve our, our working rates? Can it, can it actually improve how we manage the rest of our farm and therefore the margins on that because we're not, we're not going with fitting areas or we're not focusing on, on areas that are performing poorly. Or 
potentially um, grower might see the environmental benefits outweigh any small economic gain, which it was, for example, on Wally's, a very small economic gain compared to an environmental scheme um, from cropping it, although it can vary by a few pounds either way, depending on the years that you have when you're in the scheme. And then the key points from data collection for growers that were looking to deploy something similar on their farm would be um, 15% of the yield map points are erroneous, so it's really important that whatever software you use, Gatekeeper, Omnia, those sort of things, that there has a cleaning map function, that there's something that can get rid of data that we believe to be erroneous. Also, sorry, 22% of the fields were out by over 10% compared to recorded um, recorded data. Now, this is quite significant. We think of current wheat prices. Um, in a 10 ton wheat crop that could be 200 pounds difference from our margin um, which is quite you know way more than we'd ever looking for we're identifying what's marginal and what's not so it's really important we have something to ground truth these yield maps with whether it's as brian's got grain trailer with way cells in or we're running a field level over the over the um way bridge or at the very least a field a, a farm average yield for that crop and then it also needs the accurate detailed field or at the very level crop level fixed and variable costs to calculate the, the, the situation on that specific field. A final part of the project, um, which is just a sort of snapshot here, we've still got a bit more to do on this, is the energy use, energy usage across the rotation. Uh, this is working with Doug Warner at the University of Hertfordshire and the ARU, which is Agriculture Environment Research Unit is to use life cycle analysis as a means of providing environmental profiles in agriculture. So it's basically an annual calculation of energy input. So we're not looking at emissions here, just how much, obviously strongly correlated, but how much energy is needed for each system per tonne of production. And then outputs can be expressed using functional UG, e.g. E emissions or energy use per tonne or output per hectare. We've looked at something slightly different because we're focused on margin here, just a bit of context. Um, but first, Thing to look at here is just the energy per crop um so this is just mega sorry megajoules per hectare on average across the 20 or 11 years we've got data for Brian's gatekeeper um so for example we've got energy use is higher in the all seed rate more in cereal and the spring in seed uh and this is primarily due to the nitrogen rates on those um we can see that the establishment energy usage is pretty much similar across all and the large energy consumption comes from our direct energy which is inputs fertilizer um, and pesticides and this is in line with other work excuse me so the greenhouse gas intensity from cereal crops in the yen um, uh, from adas show very similar things that majority of this is coming from nitrogen fertilizer it's not telling us anything drastically new, but what it has done is allow Brian to benchmark now going forward and then monitor how that might change as schemes come in and how he changes his farming practices over the coming years to, to meet whatever, whatever demands uh, are faced. But it's interesting again when we look at that um, energy unit per hectare of net margin. So if we think back to the previous slide that the spring beans are actually using less energy per hectare to, to establish and grow a crop, in terms of the profitability of the farm for a grower to get uh you know from one you one megajoule used to turn that into pounds per hectare net margin because the margin is much lower on the beans it's actually not a deficient economic efficient use of energy on the farm compared to our um our primary crops winter wheat winter wheat all seed rate um i'm not focused on herbage grass because we haven't got that spatial data but just an interesting interesting look there again something that brian can monitor as he goes forward um, and you can night well interesting to see there's not been a massive change over the last 10 years in both direct um, or establishment energy um, although Brian has slightly moved away from manual plowing and, and looking at other different systems of tillage we do a slight decrease um, in the energy used in establishment but in terms of our direct energy um, little change over the last 10 years It was a few more slides, but never mind. I can put them in the report. But anyway, that's a, a brief overview of what we've done at Brian's. I didn't want to sort of get too much into it and take up all the webinar. Um, but yeah, hopefully we can have some discussions uh, around that, and, and I'd be good to get um, John and Robin's opinions on how what we've done on Brian's compared to how they've done on their farm, uh, what they recommend I could have done differently, me and Brian could have done differently, but also how their data compares to that.
Thank you, David. Um, fascinating as ever, and indeed it has got the uh, the question juices going. Uh, but please, those of you that want to ask more questions, put them in the chat box as I mentioned, along with your faces and rows of points if you want to, just as a reminder. We did, um, I, I could have shown this begin, but actually it might just be a very quick summary at the end as well, just to prove that Brian is real. But we, we have got a, a minute and a half video, which we'll, we'll show now just to, to show Brian in situ and summarize what, what David's just been talking about. And then we'll, we'll come back to, to John and Robin after that. So we've also been doing a tabletop exercise, not anything in field, but we've been looking at the data set that the farms um, created over the last 10 years. Um, luckily, I've kept all my yield maps. I've been keeping detailed analysis of um, the actual yield per field, costings per field. And so this has allowed a tabletop exercise to be done to see which part of our farms, our farm is delivering the best return on a year to year basis. So we, NIAB have been running a, a computer model um, in, in comparison with other models out there to see what parts of my farm, they call them clusters, which clusters are actually delivering year on year good margin and which ones which we would class as marginal land because if we're looking forward at putting more back into environmental schemes, looking at the um, elms or the environmental land management or any stewardship schemes coming forward, we've got to know which parts of the farms haven't been producing money um, year to year from a commercial crop. And then we've got to look at, is there something that we can do with these areas? Are they in the right location for putting options in like grass margins, um, overwinter um, long-term lays, um, pollinector mixes, wild seed mixes, or if you're looking at carbon capture and everything like that, are we better off putting them into trees? Um, there's different enterprises that can be brought onto the farm with a more environmental mindset going forward. So trying to work out how to identify your marginal land is going to be key to how we farm going forwards um, to make sure that the farm is staying profitable across every square metre, square hectare. Everything that we want to be doing is making money across our, our land that we have in our control. So there we are, there's Brian looking bright eyed and bushy tailed, he's a bit more tired now. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll move on, um, perhaps just kick off with uh, John, would, would you just like to share John, your, what your, just a brief outline of what you're farming down there in Dorset and, and, and your approach to this subject as, as far as you've got? Um, <clears throat> yeah, no, I really like um, what I've just heard from David, it, it's a very different way of looking at your marginal land compared to the way we've done it here. Um, I think for a, a farm manager or a new owner of that land, it's perfect because there's no family history, no deep knowledge of the soil. Um, uh, and it, it very much shows that you can use data from modern combines to uh, find the weaker areas of your land. Also, it's quite visual, really. Um, so you can ground truth it in the field. We're, we're half the size of Brian's farm. Uh, I'm also a tenant farmer, and, and although the temptation is to go for high yield, high output, and high profit to pay high rents, um, I, I found we'd hit a bit of a wall in terms of the type of soils we're on. And I think Brian's on soil that is capable of producing some quite high yields on average, as is proven by David's data set and his for 10 years. Um, where we're struggling to make it profitable uh, and therefore the whole farm is becoming marginal is not because we haven't been putting in inputs over the years it's the basic soils that we're on so when you're on very thin chalky downland that um and it was interesting seeing that um uh, meadow field which was uh, split into three my guess there as an ex mix farm is perhaps the two closest to the buildings had all the manure on them and the bit at the top didn't um that's historic knowledge unfortunately you can't change the soil you farm um well you can but it'll cost you billions really uh, and certainly not as a tenant so you have to cut your cloth according to the types of crop that will grow well on your soils so i think we've done that here we've realized that as i'm limited to growing cereal crops at the moment on every piece of land um 
and I can't move to diversification at this point beyond cereal cropping. Um, that we've identified uh, areas of slope, er, ju just as David said, areas of slope, small edges, uh, and stuff that basically it used to involve 13 passes for arable operations, but had massive overlaps, whether it was fertilizers, inputs, manures, etc. So we've squared off every field and we've looked at <clears throat> taking areas such as uh, underneath a southern hedge, where those hedges are probably getting bigger now recognizing that you can't crop up very close to a hedge due to shading for example and we all know <clears throat> crop growing requires um, light as well as water and other factors so so really it, it's about looking at what percentage of the farm you want to put into environmental schemes uh, what we do clashes horribly with the high yield high input um, you know high gross margin side of life but we found that on more marginal land, by going for low input, lower yields, um, we are finding we can afford to pay the rent uh, with slightly higher margins. Um, I don't mind admitting that now because frankly, on an AHA tenancy, when you have a rent review, it's based on what the ground can yield, not what we actually can make as a business as a profit. So I think certainly for longer term tenants, um, you can be quite straight and go, well, I could push this and turn this into a dust bowl covered in calcium carbonate, also known as carbon, interestingly, um, where we basically are burning off higher yields of crop than we can actually afford to input back in, especially with the current input costs and prices. Or you try and find a middle ground, which is, I think is what we've achieved here now. Um, you can use the term regenerative if you wish. Other people call me a vegan. Um, it, it's nothing to do with that. It's to do with trying to balance my inputs to my outputs. And if you can make that at roughly zero, um, you are achieving a regenerative type uh, practice or co conservation even, you know, that, that's a, a fair term to be used. So where we've currently found our marginal land um, has not been paying the bills in a traditional rotation. That's gone into things such as fallow, it's gone into very, very low pass energy crops, um, linseed, um, reed canary grass we grew for four years on 10 hectares on really steep slopes that frankly would flip a combine over or have the rollers following past your uh, tractor um, next to you when you were trying to roll it in less than um, sensible conditions. And again, you know, Brian, Brian in a way can be quite competitive with the Ukraine who have big, big flat fields. I assume, you know, he's probably not quite as rolling countryside as we are here. Um, and likewise, if you've got tiny fields, trying to put a combine in there with a 30 foot plus header, um, frankly, you've probably burnt more diesel getting to the gate, hitching on and engaging it, uh, and then removing it again from the field than you burnt actually going up and down that small field um, to take that yield crop off. That would give you a very if you were honest with yourself and worked it out from the moment you turn the key to the moment you turn the key off for that one small field, which is hard to access, you might find that your um, uh, cost in, which I thought was brilliant in, in megawatts per hectare or whatever, or energy consumption per hectare, might be horrific compared to being able to go out into, say, a much larger, big, flat, arable field, which I know in the east of England there are many of, uh, and less so here in the southwest. Where, where you turn the key once and you run that combine for 16 hours or longer um, with very little turning uh, and wasted time in between. So so really it's cutting your cloth to the size of your farm, um, but it is possible to do. Uh, and in our case, we've done maximum environmental support payments. Um, as we know, they're changing. They're possibly not gonna be as tempting by 2027 as they perhaps are now. So the more you can learn about maximizing your net profit from your cereal production and forget gross margins, uh, probably more likely you are to stay in business for a bit longer. John, you, you raised some really interesting points there and, and I for one are going to come back to you on some of them. But before we sort of get into more open discussion, Robin, uh, what's your situation up there in Gloucestershire? Well, no, sorry, Wiltshire, isn't it? Still, it's Wiltshire. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I'm a farm manager at Charlton Park. We are about 1,500 hectare farm. Um, arable with is here is about just over a thousand hectares. Plus, there's we've got a contract farm up the road. Um, we I started here in 2003. Uh, we got our first yield mapping in 2005. Uh, and so I've got a huge amount of data, which initially went on multi-crop back in the day and now onto Gatekeeper. Um, I suppose I'll probably be doing margin maps since 2007, 2008. Um, and yeah, I mean, just thinking about, it, I suppose our first tidying up happened in 2007. And now every field's got a two meter margin around the outside of it. It aids logistics. It means we can hedge cut deep in winter um, and I think sort of marginal land you've got it sort of three things you've got the financial side you've got the logistical side and you've got the environmental side and the environmental side is coming on more and more so how can we earn money out of that what can we do can we carbon sequestration what's our bio biodiversity score um, and again going to John's point you know I mean, our, our fields vary from I think probably the smallest is about one and a half hectares to the biggest being 35 hectares and the next one down was 25 but i just stuck an ad plant in that so that takes that one down to 18 so yeah second biggest farm on this field on the farm i stuck an ad plant in the middle um but yeah i mean if you go back exactly 12 months ago to the day we we'd gone into a stewardship scheme we were planning on quarter of the farm being overwintered stubbles because of oilseed rape at the time consistently for the past three years been an absolute nightmare um wheat prices were sat fairly stagnant where they were inputs were slowly rising um and we sort of went down the stewardship routes and doing low input cereals uh fodder fodder beet over the winter fodder radish and stuff over the winter for sheep and getting mid-tier on that and then sort of the little corners that weren't productive which had been in grass or anything else um or fallow i suppose back in the day of efa we put those into the wild flowers and the wild bird mix so it is just to me as you, i mean you can't see a map here with maps over there but um our, every field on here has got at least five sides to it none of them are square um, there's a ditch and a hedge around every single field so also with the way legislation is going with chemical application it makes it harder so we're constantly thinking of how can we make life easier, more streamlined, more efficient. Um, you know, we have probably average field size would be eight hectares. We run a 36 meter sprayer um, and I've got a combine with a 30 foot table on it. But actually that is the most efficient way. And we change the tram lines to what the issue is in the field to make it the most efficient. So with marginal land, it's not just a matter of what's it yielding what's it costing it is how can i improve my overall efficiency as well by taking out certain parts so as i said so we went into gatekeeper um, i create a margin map which goes from less than 300 pound a hectare 300 to 600 and over, and over 600 pound a hectare gross margin and then from that anything under 300 straight away goes out and goes into stewardship um, and now, I mean, we've got a New Holland combine, which actually is very, very accurate on the yield maps because it takes into account bushel weight, whereas um, the, the slightly lighter green combines don't take into account that on a, a, as often. So um, we've got Weybridge as well. So I know ground truthing it, it is very, very spot on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's that's how we've, we've started. Um, that's probably just enough to... to to cover and I can yeah. go a bit further I can talk about where we are now with a big change <laughs> yeah thank, thanks Robin so David there's sort of both of them have come at it sort of in different ways but in in a similar way as well what's the sort of minimum number of years data and and, and sort of heart searching do you need to go back up over to, to to make this exercise valid in your opinion I mean obviously Brian had a lot of years records uh, and Robin has as well come to that but what's your view um, yeah, it's interesting. So I, I, I probably didn't make it quite clear enough. So we obviously, Brian didn't, we don't have yield data for the herbage grass seed at Brian. So that was the big hole in the, the, the data set effectively. Um, but actually when we're thinking about schemes, if actually 
on the 12 year rotation, if we've got herbage grass every two, two out of 12 years, we've actually got a 10 year data set there anyway. So it wasn't a massive issue. And if we're putting a scheme in for five years, well, maybe we just avoid the grass because we're, we're not sure and Brian's margins on his grass are generally better than some of his other break crops. So you'd probably avoid the grass anyway for, from an annual scheme, long term schemes, that's not such an issue. But to answer your question, um, you can run the clustering from anything from two years uh, and actually on some of Brian's farm, certainly well, a large portion of Brian's farm, actually you can see some by some of those line graphs that the, the same the same areas perform exactly the same in terms of their relative change year on year out. So we could identify those patterns with only two or three years of data set and actually just having those extra years, all that does is increases our confidence in actually uh, how much it's costing and obviously if the the, the more relevant we get or the the, the further runs closer to sort of now um we're taking into account more modern fertilizer prices the actual grain prices whereas we go back 2010 or or it further um actually your margins you might want to start doing it based on current prices what's marginal and that's something that brian's keen to do on farm here is actually use these yield maps as sort of a retrospect if we were to get that yield next year what would be marginal um currently because obviously that would change with 200 pound a ton wheat prices um so roundabout answer yeah i think it, it depends if you've got massive variation so for example i've run the clustering at morley um just in norfolk which is on a slight well a, a lighter soil than brian still not very sandy but actually we see much bigger variation in, in where good bits are and bad bits are based on season. So, you know, in dry years, we'll see droughting out um, and that the areas that are potentially much lighter will drought out. But then in wet years, actually, the heavier, the last couple of years, the heavier parts of the farm haven't performed as well. So you get a sort of much bigger fluctuation. Um, so it does depend on, on the soil type and, and how much variation you see. Um, but yeah, two or three, Two years, absolute minimum, but yeah, five years is, is really good, and that's what we sort of go with going forward. John, there's obviously a lot of science and, and, and data gone into David's exercise, and Robin's probably done the same as well, but what's your gut feeling, John, as to how, how well you could almost visually uh, map your fields? <coughs> Maybe um, looking at a yield, maybe looking at a yield map, or even just knowing knowing your land, and would that be good enough in your view for for the purposes of this exercise? Yeah, I, I I think in the absence of staff, because it's your own farm and you have to drive up and down those fields, and there's only so much time you can do it in RTK hands-free mode and look at your phone. Um, of course, you're going to be looking from the sprayer you're going to be watching weaker patches and stronger patches you're going to be noticing stuff that unless you've got an extremely good employee who treats the farm as their own um, and inputs that data as they go along i'm afraid the computer that is our brain is far more powerful at doing an analysis in front of our eyes and seeing the better areas the weaker areas seeing areas that are shaded at different times of year you know how far is that shade from that tree coming out into my field if I drew a line down through there, would that be a, a good place to put it? Or should I put it two meters to the right or left? Um, you can tell by slope. You can you can definitely tell by soil color. You can all of those visual indicators that, yes, there is tech out there to measure. Uh, and in the absence of um, being on the ground yourself or having to make decisions without being the operator, um, you need that kind of data to back up. Uh, what you're doing so we we've used soil maps um 12 years ago i think when they first brought out satellite imagery from soil uh, which is a front is now frontier product um i found that kind of useful but actually it didn't tell me a lot of data that i couldn't see with my own eyes i i drive my own combine i don't have really it's quite an old machine so we i don't even really calibrate the yields therefore that it's telling me but you can see visually ups and downs and variation as you go for a crop your brain goes oh i'm on the half cropping or half a swath or full swath um, so again whereas you're using analytics david's using analytics and other managers are using analytics i'm just using a, my brain as the analytic to calculate is this yield roughly where i want it to be I'm, like a lot of people the the reality is by the time i've dried it 
uh, measured the trailer loads you don't get a full trailer every time so that's a difficult one to quantify the best best thing i use is uh, how many tons have i sold that are weighed in in a lorry and are gone from the farm minus any home safe seed divided by the area tick that that is my yield and that's not a pub chat i would just tell people in the pub that is the yield we got for that crop this year um it, it you can make you can be too specific and too complicated uh, um variable rate for example has its place if you're using a lot of high inputs but if you're not using high inputs you don't really need variable rate so if you're in a really high input situation variable rate will pay for itself quite well um but yeah it's observation it's you it's pulling all of that information together philip uh, and generating um a realistic on on the ground boots on the ground view of the best places um to pull out of production or change your production to a higher net margin not mm. gross margin net profit not gross margin yeah does, does that align with your story robin yeah i mean i probably i probably should have said that uh my two guys on the farm um had been here since 1991 um and yeah they, they say they knew the farm inside out and I've got that map there because that's a soil map and we're sat right in the sort of area well there where it all changes so we're very very changeable soils um and at the end of the day you go on google earth go on bing maps and look and there's a lovely photo in the summer of your farm cultivated and you can see the different colored soils the different soil types we've just created zones ourselves on gatekeeper which we use um yeah, I've look, I looked at soil on 100 hectare block, did it once, brought nothing to the party. Um, we haven't put any compound fertilizer on this place since 2003, with the exception of this year because of uh, a growing maize. But, uh, I heard it was a bit hungry. Um, but yeah, no, historically on arable crops, we've been on cereal crops, we've been yeah, low input when on the edge of the brash, our soil varies from gravel, brash, medium heavy clay caps, really, really variable, a couple of nice north facing banks. Um, and and it is, it's, it's, it's combining all that knowledge. I mean, I, I understand what John's saying, but I, yeah, combine yield data is pretty spot on because it will tell you to the line. Um, and I always think, yeah, I must do something there when I'm out there, but I always forget by the time I get back to the office, whereas if it comes back up in glaring, uh, glaringly obvious, um, pinks and reds you know there's a problem there um we do a lot of on-farm trials as well so ground truthing and looking back and the biggest influence on all that sort of yield data is weather and soil type and it, it's interesting i've got a budget up here at the moment and um because of most people probably sat watching this is going well no land's marginal at the moment because we are 200 pounds a ton and a shed full of fertilizer we're going to make good money but I mean, I'm looking at my my budget or well, my actual wheat. Okay, we had a bit of second wheat this year. It was a good year. We did eight and a half ton a hectare. For me, I'm chuffed to bits with that. Um, and so I started selling early, and we've still got a little bit more to sell. But at the moment, I'm selling 162 pound, 167 pound a ton. So happy, which gives me a gross margin of 884 pounds on the wheat. Well, out of interest, I thought, all right, I haven't got pretend I'm going fertilizer in the shed. I'm just having to pay £500 a hectare for my fertiliser. Well, that brings my gross margin on the wheat down to sub 600. But hang on, wheat's £200 a tonne today, so I can sell it for £200 a tonne. With fertiliser at 500 okay, we're back over this year's gross margin at 911 So it's tricky at the moment to see where you would go with marginal land with prices as they are. But it couldn't take long for wheat to drop to 150. Putin still decided that he doesn't want to let the gas out of his country. And wheat's now to, down to 486 pounds a hectare. So that's our best growing crop, best margin crop. Well, hang on. I can stick uh, I can stick the whole farm into, I don't know, let's go for extended overwintered stubbles for 436 pounds without getting out anything out of the ground, any tractor out into the field. So it suddenly comes back around and you can't go, this is 
where we are today, you've got to look at it on that long-term average. And yeah, I it, totally it, agree with you, Robin. Yeah, it's all about averages, isn't it? Yeah. It's really tricky because at the moment we've got this spike and it could stay up. I mean, I can, I've sold a chunk for just sub 200, 197 the other day. It's 200 quid today. Actually, I should probably go and sell 90% of my uh, average crop because of it's right decision to do today. And yeah, stewardship, if I had half, if I had my stewardship as it was, would I still have quarter of the farm in overwintered stubble? Hmm. I think I'd struggle to justify that one. I really would. Of course, the other issue is that, that both of you have sort of indirectly said that we're talking about sort of generating margin and, and whether it's gross margin or net margin. But the other question is, is, is what do you need on your farm? Because if, if you were a tenant farmer with, with two wives, five children at public school and three F bases parked in the drive, it doesn't matter if you've got wheat selling for £300 a tonne, generating 12, 12 tonne a hectare, it's still not going to be enough. So as, as well yeah. as you've got, you've got to identify what your profit requirement is for the business, got drawings, rent, bank loan replacement, replacements, regardless of what you're farming uh, you know, before you start. You, you know my views on this, Philip, in, uh, in that scenario from benchmarking, you have variable costs, you have fixed costs, and then you have lifestyle costs. And it's getting that balance and some people's lifestyle co costs yeah. do not equal their output costs. And for, for some like John, uh, lifestyle has to include rent. Okay, so so I've got a rent to pay. Um, I find it horrific. I divide that by the total yield. Let's say uh, I grew continuous spring barley at seven tonnes a hectare, which we used to do, we can do, if I put enough inputs into it. And we found on average uh, you'd make a profit without BPS one and a half years in 10 um, after costs. Uh, and we were pretty damn efficient for a tenant farm, quite honestly. We had it compared to other farms, we were on our game. But that still didn't make me go, I'm going to keep doing this and banging my head against the wall doing seven day weeks. I went, I've had enough of this. Um, we are not being paid enough uh, on average for the crop compared to our input costs. Um, I didn't have the luxury of mortgaging some more land out or, or diversifying particularly easily. So um, every time a bill comes in, you look at your ton of grain and go, how much of that ton of grain is paying for that bill? Uh, very quickly, you find that you are living on a subsidy check. That is your profit. Um, for us, that's not a great profit. It's just a living. I think it's probably a fair living. Um, I'm not a multi-millionaire. I sit on a multi-million pound business, but I'm not a multi-millionaire even slightly. But at least now I'm actually earning a fair return for my efforts. Um, and I'm yielding 50% of the grain crop that I used to. Um, now that's 50% that used to go to the export market. I'm still feeding the nation with the um, other half that was always used to feed our nation. But should I be subsidizing uh, other countries' food production? No. I shouldn't. So that's why I've chosen to use fallow, for example, on 50% of my land. Um, stop wasting money on shiny toys. Although I say that we'll still have one or two shiny toys as in farm machinery. Uh, and you cut your cloth accordingly. But I certainly wouldn't want an FBT tenancy because I know for a fact that without a BPS, most FBT tenant, tenant uh, farmers would be losing quite a lot of money, even at £200 a tonne. So it's a different way of looking at it, Robin. Um, you've diversified into an AD plant. Well done. You've moved from food to energy and you've reduced your risk, but that still hopefully ties in with being a farmer. Um, we've we've yeah, moved right. to energy and environment. You know, it's kind of, it's, you've just got to diversify to survive. Um, John, uh, you've led me into another question here, and, and I'm just conscious that time's flying by, and it, we're going into quite a diverse discussion, which is inevitable with this one. But um, David mentioned in his slide that there was a slide on the sort of energy uh, energy aspect of different crops, and, and you know, winter, winter beans. Uh, you know, the bean story was a, was an interesting one, I thought. Does that change, you know, particularly as we're perhaps thinking about carbon now and issues about carbon, do, does that bean story and the energy story change your view of cropping? 
John the other any immediate <laughs> or, or Robin, I don't know. John, you're muted. Um, yeah, sorry, I thought you were targeting that question at David uh, Phillips, so I was off the game. Um, does it make, does it tempt me to go down to spring? Well, we always grew spring beans here as our break crop, um, our 5% EFA requirement, we moved to spring beans because we knew it was a very low cost input crop, used a lot, lot less fuel. Uh, and so that was, um, is a good choice in a break crop. It also fixes nitrogen, so you can, it has a lot of agronomic, benefits in rotation if there's a market for it you know and that's the problem um you you can grow beans that are good enough for export to egypt to be turned into falafels uh and if you get that contract which is quite rare well done you know you'll make a good margin but usually they get sent for feed feed compounders don't particularly want the bean so it's your end market um uh, but in terms of, I'm not allowed to grow legumes at the moment, except for in my fallow mixes, I have to grow a low input spring cereal. So I'm limited. Actually, the government's limited me to what I can grow or want to grow in rotation. Um, otherwise, I'm in breach of their draconianly tight EU type rules. Um, but no, I'd, I'd far rather be growing far more diverse, smaller, higher value crops. Um, I love the idea of maize with lucerne in, in permanent cropping um, I think that that allows you to farm in a far more three-dimensional vertical way uh, and absorb nutrients from deep um, they're non-competing plants uh, and I only really heard about that in a webinar a few weeks ago but it having read into it that would be far cheaper for me per kilowatt hour or kilowatt hectare or kilowatt ton whatever um, methodology you want to use uh, than having to grow spring barley uh, spring barley then a cover crop than the spring barley because every time I do that it's high energy input and output with machines chemical and um, and fertilizer if we choose to use it so um, yeah I mean every farm manager is going to have to make their own call um, but ultimately you do still need a market and I know that there is still a market demand for spring barley so be Rob, beans Robin, are not in the rotation yet to simply Robin, answer that. Yeah. Robin does energy use come into your equation or are there other factors at play um, yeah, no, energy use is coming more and more. I mean, we're just uh, doing a carbon audit and uh, biodiversity audit at the moment. That's my plan for the winter. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, as I've mentioned, we put a net, started putting an AD plant in uh, back in February. It should be running in January. We start feeding it on the 3rd of January. And what was the reason? Well, where we are is two miles from Tetbury, which was the wool market of the UK. And I expect you go back 150 years, all of this was covered in sheep. And for some stupid reason, we all got the plough out and ploughed it up and decided it was going to be arable land. And it doesn't grow arable land and it's not very efficient arable land. And I just thought, well, what can I do to go back to that sort of stage? And my logic was, let's try and get the circular economy where we're growing a crop and it's staying on the farm, so it goes into the AD plant, the digestate comes out, and I'm hoping in sort of three, four years' time, we won't buy any N, it'll all be, um, it'll all be grown on the farm because of the digestate coming out, food waste going in, or bringing, bringing in another 50% of product. It, it is quite scary, I'm not going to lie. Um, but it, to reduce our carbon footprint, that'll have a monumental step but it's how I then look at establishing crops. Um, I mean, I did, did a calculation the other day, I think watching how our fuel usage has gone over the last five years, we've dropped nearly 20 litres a hectare. So we're down to 75 litres a hectare to grow a whole crop. So from cultivation to the end of 75 hectares. Um, can I strip much more out of that? I don't really think I can. And and that's all my diesel use across the estate. So I'm being a bit nasty on the arable crops. I haven't done anything on the grassland or the hedges or anything like that. I just put it all against the arable crops. Um, so yeah, I mean, energy, you look at any carbon order, it's energy and it's, and it's fertilizer. And I mean, what have we got? We've got two meter margins around the farm is 125 hectares. Well, that is sequestering a lot of, carbon, a lot of 
not no no real inputs on there at all. Um, and I mean, I know John John goes on about sort of a tenant farm versus a, an owned farm, and we've got tenant farms. We contract farm a farm, and they've got no machinery, they've got no labour. And actually, I've said to him, he'll make more money going into stewardship, which I think is very similar to yours, John, of half the farm over winter stubble, and the other half of the farm as um, the low input cereal. And we will just put a, uh, a, a clover story in the bottom. And I think there, again, we can cut our fertiliser cost and just try and get everything just, I mean, we, we are very low input. And I'm just trying to take it down the next level again and it's, okay. it's all about it's being efficient and it's it's being low cost and i mean we one thing we haven't said we're talking gross margins but actually the most important thing is net margin but actually we've already smashed our fixed costs down to to, to sub 300 pound a hectare um and i can't i don't think i can actually do anything there to make it better i, I could drop a tractor out but it, it, it's amazing. You, you can get a cheap, high horsepower tractor. It's a hell of a lot more fuel efficient than ragging the balls off a, a, a low horsepower tractor. It really is. Or you could just. Um, That's whoops. another debate. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I suppose yeah. I'll quickly add. Yeah, I mean, I've half my horsepower, Robin, hey. and my fuel consumption's down to peanuts now because I yeah. just do one pass. I, That's I, what we do. I, I destroy thick two year legume and drill a crop of barley in one pass mm. and we're using six litres a hectare even at 72p a litre I really don't care about the fuel price and that's using a tiny little 150 horsepower tractor three metres wide yeah. and all my six metre kit Philip saw is rotting in the barn all the big six metre disc cultivators Vardstat Rapide um, no but, it, it so isn't about that, scale it, it isn't about scale it's about yeah. 1600 rpm and uh, do as little movement as possible to get a yield. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's okay. that's include that's include that that co that number is including all the combining costs, the sprays, fertilising, the whole lot. So that's complete the whole lot. And actually, like you said, I mean, we, okay, we we cultivate and then drill, but it's it's very little fuel usage. There. It's like six liters, like you're you're at. Yeah, and and you've definitely you've definitely got your you've definitely got your fuel right down, definitely, which yeah. which I respect. But a lot of people are still recreation ploughing, yeah. tillaging, wasting a vast amount of profit. Uh, but if that's their hobby, carry on. It's about marginal <laughs> land as well, Philip, because of, if you're doing it on marginal land, you're really losing money. <laughs> I suppose that was that was my <laughs> last. David, David. The reason of putting it in there was. Uh, unfortunately, the slide was well, on the end there, but it'll be in the report. Is that actually we're focused on margin, and we've shown there's areas of the farm that are £400 compared to £600. That's just looking at, you know, at the moment, energy is yeah. part of that, but actually, we're not paid to reduce the energy as such directly. But actually, going forward, we might be really encouraged to reduce energy considerably, and it makes much more sense when we start taking those areas out of land. Actually, we're then also reducing the energy considerably on those areas also maintain the profit so it was, it was a nice figure on one of those clusters that shows the sort of the energy per cluster um, profit and then you sort of exactly you know it, it gets the clusters get further and further apart because you're just layering up what's going on on that cluster um you know as you, you're low yielding and at the moment energy's at a price where it's not impacting it too much but if we if it gets to a point where it really is impacting it those margins are going to get wider and wider on those clusters David, on that point, yeah. David, uh, I'm just conscious of time still. There's, there's a couple of questions I want to get in. Um, you, one of your slides showed a yield performance across the whole farm. Um, does that enable you to compare between fields and does clustering enable you to identify whole fields that are performing right or not performing right? Or is it very much an intra-field exercise at the end of the day? So it's very difficult. So Brian's done, he's got his field yields. So he can pair fields quite easily without yield maps. Um, the difficulty comes is that actually over the course of 12 years, you get the odd crop that's failed here and there. And actually there's very few, you know, looking at Brian's 35 fields, there's actually very few fields that have been treated identically the same over the last 11 years. There's always, you know, the odd crop that's diverted here, the rate failed there, it didn't fail there. It was drilled 10 days later. This was drilled a month later. 
Um, so it's all it's all very hard to do that. But there are the odd place um, where we've done on the, in the workshop in June where there was four fields that have been pretty much treated. There's certainly been in wheat the same years. Um, and we could then run the clustering on those fields together um, and it identified two or three clusters. And from a margin point of view, you know, they're still the same. We just identify where the lowest margin is. Um, and some of some of these lower margin clusters or fields are because potentially Brian's having to go a couple of years spring barley in a row to get on top of black grass or for, if, you know, putting an extra spring crop in there. So actually by reducing his cash crop, which is winter wheat or herbage grass, those are naturally standing out. And then obviously if there's an issue there with black grass that's causing them to be lower margin, then surely that, that you know, they're obvious places that you may then go look and go, well, actually, let's take this whole field out. Um, and there are the odd, I kind of avoid that in that there is the odd field like that at Brian's, and it, it, you know, it kind of the clustering becomes null and void um, slightly because you just take the whole field out, um, put the whole five hectares into a thing because you're trying to get on top of black grass over three years. So those sorts of things can be looked at, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky to compare field to field because of those, that not just the variation in cropping, but you know, you might just decide to drill one you know, 27th of September, it then rains for two months and you don't get onto the next door field until the 11th of October. Well, that's not necessarily because the fields, are, you know, a worse performing mm -hmm. field it's because you didn't get around to it before the rain. So it's, it, it does make it hard without those sort of intricacies accounted for. Yeah, and I guess that's the benefit when you really can stretch over 10 years of data because you start to lose some of those weird and wonderful and horrible moments. Uh, there's, yeah. there's another question here um or it sort of links back to monday's webinar actually as well but a uh, question for sarah but what 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 john do you and uh, robin do you feel about well placed in field conservation strips in large fields and how they impact on on the workability and, and profitability of, of your farms um you do you mind john, robin for just sort of oh. observation so our observation over the hedge of a number of larger arable farms is the assist scheme where they have the six meter wildflower margins through the large through large blocks of arable land and i'm not seeing a great deal of biodiversity increase as a result of that um when compared to looking at creating more habitat type um diversity there's definitely a role for it so answering sarah's question yeah, it's far better to have something nice breaking up the monoculture of a very large field. If you're in smaller fields, I think it makes less difference. And if you think that putting a six meter strip all the way through the center of a field, um, just so a few beetles might be tempted to live there, is going to make a great difference, you're probably wrong because uh, beetles need a bit more than just a six meter strip. And I know they can only walk 50 meters out and back in a day and or overnight back and in before they're predated. But I think um, if you're still using insecticides and high input products, it doesn't matter how many beetle banks you have, you're not going to be that kind to the beneficials. So it's a lovely start. I think it's really very important to encourage industrial farmers to think a little more about biodiversity. And certainly if you've got a line of pylons, um it does definitely make sense to put a strip up through there rather than try and drive your big heavy kit and sprayers around a line of pylons that may not be a perfect rtk linear uh, line in your field but that's intelligent that that's a good use of space compared to wrapping the 36 meter sprayer boom around a um, power cable or worse your driver going to sleep on rtk and driving into it so um yeah, I, I think I think it it has merit, and things like the assist project have merit. But we could do a lot, lot more with it. Stop thinking so linear in in terms of how you design these schemes, um, and your imagination is really the limit. Uh, and talking to other people about the results they're getting. Robin, sorry. Yeah, could yeah. you, Robin? Yeah, I agree, agree completely with John. I mean, uh, I think if you put a, a strip through the middle of our field, it'd be a nightmare because the beam would be over it one way and coming back down the other way would be over the other side. Uh, I think it's much more important to do, I mean, like we've done strips around every single field to link, just create a big network of wildlife corridors. Um, and we're seeing a, a massive change just purely. I mean, this is what is now 15 years of having these 
corridors and just linking wildlife. You just see everything move. And we're seeing things coming on here that we've never seen before. Our deer are changing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see. But yeah, I mean, the strip through the middle, as you say, if it's with pylons, crack on. But we haven't really got the topography for it. I think if you're over in the east and you've got 100, 100 plus acre fields, then yeah, you've got to break up that that monopoly, that monoculture, but you've also got to create the corridors within all the other fields as well. It doesn't do anything by just having one strip straight through the middle. Great. Thank you very much, gents. Um, time has beaten us. I know Robin's got the dash, uh, so I'll, I'll wrap up there, but just uh, a big thank you to you, uh, Robin, John, and, and not least David for, for a lot of work and research, bringing it to life, Brian in his absence. Um, I hope you all enjoyed this webinar. Thank you for your questions. Uh, as ever, as I said at the beginning, it's it's on. It'll be recorded and on the on the YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and look at sections of it, please please do. Just also a quick thank you to Michelle behind the scenes, who's been masterminding the techniques and make sure it's all running smoothly. So thank you very much, Michelle, as well. So all that remains Thanks, me everyone. to do is go. have a good weekend. Yeah. Thank you for thank you for attending. Thank you for participating, and uh, have a good weekend. Bye bye for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.